This is GABNET, the Great American Broadcast Network, now in its seventh year. Talk like you've never heard it before. Bennett, and yes, this is The Ramble. Uh, wait a minute, let me just get this going here and we'll be good to go. Here he is, one of my favorite people in the whole world, one of the funniest human beings I've ever known. Uh, that's a lot to, to uh, live up to, isn't it? I can't live up to that. Yeah, <laughs> Larry Bubbles Brown, ladies I've, and gentlemen. Once again, I've let you down, <laughs> Well, once again, there's no end to your letting me down. No, it's a very busy week. We've had Dave Chappelle getting attacked on stage. Yeah. Which uh, I would like. Lo- he had a really good security crew. I like the. <laughs> like, like they took care of that guy. They beat so. the crap out of him. <laughs> I would like to have a security crew like that just for if the audience wasn't laughing, just turn them loose on the audience. Well, I think he's had an indication in the, in recent months that you know that he has to have that kind of security. I'm, yeah, I'm sure he doesn't like it, you know. Uh, but he he's happy to, I suppose, have it. So, you know, nothing wrong with that. Someone said Will Smith may have started this by attacking Chris Rock. Well, uh, you know, I mean, uh, well, I don't know if you have anything to be afraid of because you're not you're not that kind of comedian who enge- no. who engenders, you know. If you're talking, I think, if, yeah, if you're talking about anything remotely political, you. Well, the thing that's made Chappelle, you know, popular uh, has been his uh, outspokenness in his act, you know, and that will engender threats to your family and to you and so on in this day and age. I mean, in the old days, I mean, can you imagine Lenny Bruce today, the kind of <laughs> protection he would have to have, you know? And, uh, I mean, it, 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 it's just that you guys have a certain craft that you do and it's a you know it's a very important craft uh it it uh, i think it's one of the more important crafts to our society but that's just me but the fact is that you have a craft and you want to do it and you shouldn't have to do it with any sense of holding back you know uh, you're you're out there to make people laugh, and sometimes you miss your mark. Sometimes you make mistakes, yeah. you know. But that's the risk you take when you're a, an edgy comic. Uh, I don't know if I consider you an edgy comic. Maybe, no. maybe you're the opposite. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. I got. Uh, I opened for Norm Macdonald a lot. I was very lucky to have that. He liked me. And uh, he told me once, he said, comedy's funny. You, you go out there to make people laugh. Sometimes not only do they not laugh, but they actually become infuriated. <laughs> <laughs> you work with him a lot. I didn't know that. Uh, yeah, he had me open for him every time he was in the Bay Area. So, he's, uh, yeah, he liked me a lot. So great guy yeah yeah that's what i hear i never i never knew norm i never had norm on my show he's one of the few comics i can say that i never came in contact with during that you never had him on the show wow that's wild i I don't think i don't think so maybe i did and i didn't remember it you know i don't remember him being on this show but uh yeah but, you know, every time I watch something, I look at it, and I go, well, I know him, and I know him, and I know him, and I know him, I know her, you know. Um, we still don't have the predominance of female comics, do we, that we do to male comics? It's certainly come up quite a bit, but, uh, yeah, I would say it's probably a 80-20 uh, percentage in the in i mean 80 percent male 20 percent female. Yeah, yeah. you know why i think it is and i'm you know, people are going to hate me for this i've been saying this for years i don't think women have the capability to do what it takes to be funny 
Wow. Now, let me explain this. Yeah. <laughs> let me explain, explain this. Before anyone rushes the stage. <laughs> Before you come after me with a gun that's a phony gun with a knife on the end of it, please just hold off for a second. My feeling on the thing has always been, because let's face it, when you're saying 80-20, it's not like anybody saying, hey, females, uh, don't come along. Oh, by the way, we just got we just got hung up on here. We had a problem. Let me recall him. It just, uh, I, we use Skype for these calls, and uh, this is Larry unavailable, probably hasn't hung up yet. He doesn't know I'm not there any longer. Here we go. Here we go. Yep. Okay. I don't know what the hell happened. You know, Skype, what the hell. Yeah. Anyway, no, the point I'm making is is that women, uh, when you say there's a 20, uh, 80, 80, 20. 80 disparity between the two, that's not because women are being kept out of the business. And that's not being done because uh, uh, women can't get the jobs doing stand-up comedy. I, would you say there's any kind of... Thing against no, I don't women. think they've they've never been kept out. But uh, in God, with Joan Rivers and Phyllis Diller, it was probably ninety nine to one percent back well, then. Well, well, here's the reason why, and see if if I if you don't agree with me. Women, when they are growing up, are socialized as children to always be be a lady. You know what I'm saying. Always mm-hmm. be, uh, o- 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 always hold themselves back and be very sedate and be, you know, where guys are always socialized, especially in the playground, to be as goofy as humanly possible. Right, yeah. So that being the disparity socially, because girls are not raised to be goofy, it's very hard for a woman to suddenly be able to do comedy. Does that make sense? That makes a lot of sense, yeah. Yeah. And I'm not saying that women are inferior at it or whatever. I'm just saying they're not socialized to do it. Guys are, what happens? You go to the playground and what do we do? Get goofy, right? Mm-hmm. We, you know, did silly things. I mean, maybe we weren't very good at it, but we were all, guys were, Yeah. we grew or up. Or in my case, uh, when you're getting bullied, they use humor as a defense. Right, right. And I don't know, uh, bullying goes on with women but in an entirely different manner. So they don't need to have that kind of defense mechanism. Uh, usually they take it out in other ways, you know. Uh, but it, 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 I just feel that that's the reason why women don't really make good comics, because they're not socialized to be goofy. I, made, well, I hope I made my case. Yeah, know. I think you did. Uh, I'm trying to think. Who was, who was the first... Uh female comic that was big uh first female comic that was big well i mean you can go back to mom's Mabley. mom's Mabel. i used to see her on merv griffin <laughs> yeah you can go back to uh, let's see female uh, well funny females i'm trying to think if like in the 30s and 20s if there were any female. there weren't any stand-ups then were there not that i know of but i'm sure there were women who tried you know i mean there were always going to be women who had fought against that socialization and went out and tried to be funny, but I don't think they were accepted quite as much. Again, because of the audience who didn't accept a woman being goofy. Does that that make sense too? I mean, yeah, it, yeah. it's just it. it I'm I'm saying it, it's not my sexist feeling that women don't make good comics. It's the socialization that goes on in our society to make them funny or not funny and what it takes to be funny. And guys just are able to be, I mean, most comedy, most guys who do comedy are goofy at it, you know? Yeah. Or there's some level of goofiness. Um, I don't don't know if people would agree with me on this, but I, I have always maintained this. Because I used to get that all the time on my show. Why don't you have more female comics on your show? And anytime I had the opportunity to have a female comic on my show, I did it. I said I would have more if there were more. And, um, you know, so, I mean, I had people on like Paula Poundstone and Sue Murphy and uh, I'm trying to remember some of the other female comics. We had a couple of gay female comics in the Bay Area, Sabrina Matthews, uh, who I thought was very funny. She was always a favorite of mine. Right. Uh, You know, uh, is she still working at all? 
Uh, she's on the East Coast. I don't know if she's still doing stand up or not. I haven't seen her in years. Really, she was she was terrific. She I yeah, liked I, I, her. I liked her too. I really liked yeah. her. Uh, but you know, it's so it was always very hard for me to find female comics. But when I found them, I would have them on a lot. Okay, I mean Sue Murphy had a pass to come on my show. She could walk in the door, and I'd put her on the air. You mm -hmm. know, um, but uh, it it. Uh, um, it was, uh, you know, it was it was difficult for me to to have that many females on the show, and I'd say I'd do it if there were more. And then the, then I would always get, you know, the other thing I would get, why don't you have more gay comedians on the air? <laughs> and I would say I do, but you don't know they are. <laughs> okay, and they don't choose to let you know they are. This was back in the day, right? I mm -hmm. said. But I have gay comics on the show all the time, but they don't come on and say, I'm gay. Uh, and then, of course, the gay community would understand that, you know. Um, that if somebody wanted to come out, it was up to them. I mean, we had one comic that won the San Francisco Comedy Competition that I didn't think, by the way, was a very good comic. He one time asked me, why am I not on your show? And I said, it's not that I don't like you, and I'm not that I don't like what you do. But it's that you're you're not the kind of funny it takes to work it on radio. You, do you understand that one too, Larry? That, yeah, that, you it, know, there's, uh, there's certain comics that can do their act, but they can't get out of their act. Mm -hmm. In radio, you kind of got to be in the moment. So. I need I needed a different kind of comic to do the radio show, uh, but so I never had. I didn't have Jim Samuels on a lot. I had him on. But he won the San Francisco Comedy Competition, and he didn't say he was gay. But it came out that he was gay, and he admitted to it and said it was fine. You know, I don't—he didn't mind it. But you know what I'm saying here, you know. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there were comics that I we had on. I mean, Kevin Meany was gay. Yeah. You know, he never said it. I was surprised when he came out, actually, to tell you the damn truth. Um. But, I was too, and uh, when I, I remember, I told my sister, "Hey, Kevin Meany, I didn't know he was gay," and she, she said, "He wore a bow tie and sang show tunes." What were you thinking? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I mean, what it was is that we we laughed at him, you know, and he made us laugh, and yeah. and the, the fact that he made us laugh was all that mattered. The sexuality didn't matter at all. And uh, um, um, so that, that's, uh, you know, but, but so, but uh, again, going back to women. So, I mean, I tried to have a lot of women on the show when I could. I would accept a lot of women comics who really weren't all that funny just to have a female voice on the show. Uh, and uh, and there were some who were very funny, by the way. Um, uh, I'm trying to remember another name here that I've somebody I really thought the world of Susan uh, Healy Susan Healy and there was a, the woman whose fa father was the cartoonist for Disney um oh god I, I on any other day of the week I would remember her name okay really a cartoonist for Disney wow yeah no he did the uh he did the uh what the mushrooms in Fantasia he really an wow. animated that yeah uh, but, but it starts with a B. Uh, but, 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 oh God, I'm, I, I have to think of her father's name, and then I can think of her name. Uh, it'll come back to me as we're talking about this. Yes. But she was very funny. She was very, very funny. Uh, and so you know, I mean, um, they were there, but it, they were hard to find. Uh, and it's you say it still holds true. Yeah, but there's certainly certainly many more women in comedy than there were. So yeah, yeah. Well, they feel safe to do it. it all, the all clear sign has been opened up. You know, people like Joan Rivers opened it up, and uh, there were quite a few female comics who came along, and uh, Lily Tomlin, people like that, who opened it all up. But uh, even though it's been opened up and the door has been opened, nobody's walking. Not enough women are walking through it. It's not like there's a 50-50 thing out there, you know? No, no, but uh, certainly more. There's 
some of them have gotten quite big. Uh, Chelsea Handler and uh, yeah, she was terrible though. I thought. And Did you think she was funny? Uh, she was. I thought she was pretty funny. Yeah. Really? I, yeah. I never. I never. I never could get into her for some reason. Then she got all. She's all political now, so I don't know if she's even doing comedy anymore. But. I was going to say, I never could get into her, but just because she wouldn't let me have sex uh, is no reason for me to hate her. Uh, no, I just, I never I never found her that funny, you know, and I often wondered why she was doing so well. I'll tell you, you know who, who's who's good is, uh, uh, what's her name, the uh, uh, comic who's the niece of, uh, uh, Amy Schumer. Uh, am I got the name right? Yeah. Yeah, she's doing well. Uh, Amy Schumer is I think you know I in the beginning I didn't like her okay because it just seemed like another one of those female comics that said look at me I'm fat you know or look yeah. at me I'm you know and then as time has gone on I've really warmed up to her comedy she's really good mm -hmm. you know she she has a real comedy mind and a lot of people go to her just to get jokes you know really yes uh, uh, if she likes them, she'll give them some jokes to do and things like that, you know. Uh, but I think Amy Schumer has uh, has done has won me over. Okay. And I find her incredibly goofy and funny, you know. And I think and, she named her kid after David Tell, so that's got to be good. So. Did, did she name her kid after David Tell? I think so. Yeah. Really named her named him named the kid Dave. Or the gave gave the kid the middle name or something. Yeah. 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 Wow. Yeah, uh, but you know, so I mean, it, 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 I, I, it, it's never been easy for women in comedy. It's that's all there is to it, and and now that we live in a very enlightened age, it's still not easy, because what you've got to do, and you know this, and this is a basic tenet: if you're a comedian and you go on stage and you don't make people laugh. Then you're not a comedian, <laughs> right? You failed. Yeah, you failed at, at your at your given profession, and I think there's a reluctance on the part of audiences subconsciously not to laugh at women as easily as they laugh at men. Really? Okay. You know, again, another conditioning thing. I I have you know the, the reason I'm saying this is not sexist and or anything like that. It's observational about the way we are as a society. Of course, the question would be, uh, how about black comedians? You know, we're talking about there being a ceiling on certain things. I think black comedians have come into their own, but when we were coming up, the majority of comedians were white, right? Oh, sure, yeah. Yeah. And then I think the guy that helped, well, uh, of course, uh, Red Fox and uh, Flip Wilson. Yeah, and then Pryor. And Pryor. You know. Uh, and and uh, I think now we have a... We, there was a thing for a while going on in comedy. Uh, what was it? Uh, uh, oh, I'm trying to remember the kind of comedy. Where it was all black comics. Uh, and I, I felt... What I didn't like about that was that I felt we were segregating comedy. Oh, Def Jam? Def Jam. Yeah, I felt it, yeah. that was kind of segregating comedy. Uh, and those guys all have had to do a certain kind of comedy, you know, which I don't understand because I'm white, you know, but they would mm -hmm. go out and go, you know, and everybody would laugh, and I'd go, I didn't understand a word the guy just said. <laughs> you know, uh, that's because I'm white. I'm terminally white. So are you, by the way, if you haven't noticed. We're shocking, <laughs> Bill Burr says, we're shockingly Caucasian. The only thing non-Caucasian about you is your last name. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, uh, but I uh, I didn't find Def Jam very funny, but then again, I, I would say to people, the reason I don't find it funny is they're not doing it for me. They're not doing it to make me laugh. They're doing it to mm -hmm. make a black audience laugh. But when you do that, you're kind of segregating... Uh, comedy, uh, because the people who are doing Def Jam should have been included just in normal comedy shows. And, um, you know, when I was booking comedians on my shows, black, white women, 
none of it mattered. Uh, I mean, Sabrina Matthews opened a lot of my shows uh, because I really liked what she was doing. Um, I mean, the fact that she's not a big comic now or nobody even knows her name is not my fault, okay? I tried to establish her. I don't know what happened. I should look her up and see if I can find out what happened. Let's look her up. I like her. Yeah, yeah. But anyway. um, So anyway, so what's new with you out there? I, You know, I talked to a guy, Len LaFrisco, who went to your comedy show. Last oh week. yeah, he took a picture. That was at uh, surprisingly good gig at Livermore last week. Mm-hmm. At, uh, yeah, and, and you look great. Uh, I do. Okay. Yeah, you look. You look as good as I've ever seen you look. I don't look. I don't look ninety. Okay. Which which proves my point that if you're good looking, you have nothing to look forward to because good looking eventually goes bad. But that would you, be, uh, I was talking to somebody about that, if you're, li- especially for a woman, if you're really good looking, a- the aging must be the most horrifying thing in the world. Yeah, but guys, uh, still, uh, in no matter what, if you're good looking when you're younger, the chances are good looking doesn't stay good looking forever. But ugly doesn't change. <laughs> so if you're ugly, you're used to it. So when you get older, you look pretty good. We got nothing to lose. You got nothing to lose. So you, you, because you always had the hangdog look and everything, it kind of becomes you now. You know? <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's like, uh, what, was the, what was the old joke? Uh, I, uh, oh, who's an actor who, who went to seed? I'm trying to think. Uh, who looked great when they were younger and, you know. So oh, many of them. I, yeah, I, what was it? I, 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 the old joke was I always wanted to look like Frank Sinatra, and now I do. Now I do. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, yeah. Uh, the face starts to look like a Halloween pumpkin in mid-November. Well, it that, looks like, yeah. like caramel candy that started to melt. Yeah. You know? But I look God. at myself in the mirror now, and I go, you know, I'm really thinking about not turning my camera on anymore. I'm just doing my show with everybody else having camera on except me, because it's yeah. just getting. My voice is still pretty young, I think. Your voice is young, so just yeah. do like you do with me. Just put your picture up from 1982. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. You know, but I mean, I, 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 uh, um, I, I, I just, uh, you know, I, just, I look at myself and I go, oh God, you know. Well, you know what what it was? I always used to bring up uh, Jackie Coogan. Remember the kid with yeah. Charlie Chaplin? Cutest kid you ever saw in your life, okay? Made millions cry. He was that good, okay? Well, that actor became, and I can then, let people will then understand what I'm saying, became Uncle Fester Uncle on the, the <laughs> Adams family. <laughs> And I always used to look at at Coogan and say, what morning did this kid wake up, look in the mirror, and say, what the fuck happened to me? Yeah. You know? Uh, and so I, um, uh, I find myself looking in the mirror going, what the fuck happened to me? Because <laughs> for most of your life, you look in the mirror and you still see the 18-year-old, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, one day, you look at it and you go, who the fuck is that? You know, <laughs> I don't understand that at all. Uh, but uh, you know, it's uh, it's uh, it's uh, um, you know, I, 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 aging is, uh, and that's the other thing that you say women face on a different level than men. Men get older, somehow we mature. Women get older, and they turn into caramel candy. You know. Yeah, uh, actors, male actors can be lead actors up till about sixty, and women are done like at forty. So. Yeah, yeah, and it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be, but that's nature, and that's the way. Yeah. That's the way it goes, you know. Uh, and um, uh, I just, you know, and and women are always going out and getting facelifts and Botox, and guys don't do that as often. You know, guys yeah. just let themselves get old, and that's it. So, but you look good. 
Well, you thank you. Good. I'll have to take a look at that. And Len said he was very funny tonight, and I said, "What did you expect?" <laughs> you know. Yeah, it was a good crowd. I was uh, I was shocked. So. I mean, do you go to a comedy show not to laugh? <laughs> you know. Yeah. Yeah, but it was it was a good what was it a good audience? Was that the reason it, it was, was so a, good? it was a little winery and they had it was a it was a tight room with 100 people and so it, yeah, it was good. So. Hey, listen, we have run out of time here, my friend. Yes, well, we'll be back. That's Larry Bubbles Brown, ladies and gentlemen. Let's all wave goodbye. Goodbye, Larry. Bye. This is GabNet, the Great American Broadcast Network. Now in its seventh year, talk like you've never heard it before. And that's Larry Bubbles Brown, folks. You know, we love Larry. Everybody loves Larry. Mm hmm. Let me see here. Have I got my picture all nice and in the right place? See? See, because if I go too close, see, then what happens? Oh, nothing much happens. Okay. Anyway, um,. Again, it's a, you know, there's maybe one person waiting to come, oh, come on right now. Yeah, just one person. Of course, if this were the only person, okay, that, uh, that, that, that was here, uh, then it would, be, it would be just fine anyway because it's, uh, it's Josh Wheeler, and Josh is uh, terrific. Oh, well, let's see here. Kevin's calling. Okay, here comes Kevin, and uh, here comes Jeff Stein. So... You know, if no, nobody else calls tonight, that's fine. We've got enough people here to hold a good conversation. Hello, guys. How are you this evening? First and waiting. All right, how are you? Yeah, good. good. How, how come always when you start, Kevin, you always get the speckly stuff, and then it goes I have away? I no idea. And then it goes away. <laughs> Never can figure that I'm out. I'm dropping in from space. You're dropping in from space, yeah. Yeah. Special. Yeah. Uh, the reason we haven't had Brian on this week is Brian is in Sweden, and uh, I um, uh, we we did the show on Monday, the uh, the uh, Monday show, the pop up show, and he called back from from Sweden because it was kind of the right time for him, because it was like six hours later, but we go on at four o'clock here, so ten o'clock at night there was fine, you know, but this show, God, if he's in Sweden right now, it's maybe. Uh, oh, I don't know, uh, 5 o'clock in the morning, maybe? <laughs> Something like that? It's early. Let's see, mm -hmm. I'll tell you what it is right now. Yeah, you'll, you'll do the research for us here. <laughs> here we go. Here it we go. It is, depending on where he is, if he's in Stockholm, Ooh. 5 o'clock in the morning. Yeah, he's Stockholm. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh uh, so he, uh, yeah, so it's 5 o'clock in the morning. So he, we probably won't hear from him. I mean, I don't expect that we should, and I won't hold him hold it against him if he doesn't call. You know? Yeah, I sent him a message about the Warriors game the other day, and he uh, answered it about, I don't know, about 10 o'clock at night, which was probably about 8 o'clock in the morning, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. How, uh, now, am I supposed to care about the Warriors game for some reason? No, well, you don't have to care about anything. No, and I know I don't have to care about anything. <laughs> I mean, no, that, they're in the playoffs, but they are they're they're in the playoffs. Yeah. What playoffs are this? Is this uh, basketball or football? Yeah, basketball. Oh, basketball. Yeah, the big round one. Yeah. Oh, the big. <laughs> is that the one you dribble? Yeah, that's the one you dribble. <gasps> yeah. That's yeah. They they wear napkins. <laughs> I was, you know, it's funny. I was never good at very many sports. I was never good at, at basketball. Was terrible. I couldn't dribble to save my life, you know. And uh, let's see here, football. Forget it. I'm nobody's. Nobody's knocking me to the ground, you know. Uh, uh, that that didn't appeal to me. Baseball, I kind of could get into. It's just I could never hit the ball. That yeah. was the problem with me, you know. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't good at very many sports. I liked swimming, but I wasn't a fast swimmer, and I didn't like diving because that was too high up, but I enjoyed swimming. So, go figure. Yeah. How about... I like diving. I like swimming. Yeah. How about you, Kevin? <laughs> I mean, I mean, uh, Josh, uh, any sport <laughs> any sport that, uh, that uh, floated your boat when you were in, in school? 
Uh, I mean, I played a few, you know. What do you mean um, you played a few? I mean, come on, that's more than I did. Yeah, I mean, I played basketball for a long time. Uh, yeah, were you, were, you but, good, uh, were you good at it? Yeah, I was a pretty good player, but I just didn't really want to play anymore. I don't know. I just guess I got tired of it. I used to play a lot when I was a kid, but I don't know why. I even stopped watching basketball years ago. I just got tired, I got of, tired it. of it after yeah. a while. How, how about you, uh, uh, Kevin? Any sports that you did in school? Who, me? Yeah. Oh, yeah. What'd you do? Baseball, basketball, football. Oh, boy. Uh, swimming. Mostly uh, football until I got hurt and they wouldn't yeah. let me play. Yeah. I played a lot of baseball. The great sport for most of the kids in my school was beating me up in the schoolyard. Yeah. You know, so they got a lot of, a lot of exercise doing that. How about Vernon? You don't look athletic. Did you? No, I was I was a bowler. You a bowler? Oh, I did bowl yeah. bowling. I did. Yeah, I did bowling. Yeah. You know, and I, I actually I actually got pretty good at it. I did too in high school. I, I averaged one hundred and eighty four on the senior league. Really? When I was a senior in high school. Wow. Yeah, I I, I had to bowl because my dad was in bowling leagues. Well, when I went to college, they said for the first two years that you were in college, this was junior college, you had to, uh, you had to take a sport. And so I looked at all the sports that were available, and the one that was available to me that seemed like a good idea was bowling. Because <laughs> all you had to do in the, in the, for, the, for the half a year is you only had to bowl 10 lines. Right? Oh, geez. You know. That's nothing. So that's nothing. So you, I just go in once a week and do a couple of lines, and finally I get them all over with by the end of the year. Maybe it was more than that. I don't know, but it was, certainly wasn't enough that it put me out. I actually go down there and do about two or three weeks at a time, and I got pretty good at it. You know, I was. I would bowl once a week when I was in, when I was on the league. Yeah, yeah. I was bowling at one point and uh, 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 over two hundred. You know. Uh, so I, I was I was fine, you know, with that. That was okay by me. There were no injuries that were going to happen from that, you know. And the only exercise was lifting the goddamn ball, which at my age then was very simple to do, you know. And I, I did okay, you know. I was okay at bowling. So uh, and then I, I got I got an A in bowling, so that was fine. And then uh, uh, there. There, there were no other sports that I've ever been involved in. I'm sorry, I just, I just didn't play them. Maybe it's I was lazy, you know? Because if you really want to play, do basketball or football or baseball, you have to work at it. You know, you can't just say, I'm going to play basketball. You, if you're going to play it and want to play on a team at school, you're going to have to work at it. And I just wasn't my willing son, to put out that much energy, you know. My son was really into soccer. Your what? My son. Yeah. My son was uh, was the goalkeeper on his high school soccer team. Yeah, yeah. As a as a spectator sport, I actually enjoy soccer. You know, it's a very it's uh, it's an exhausting game. I mean, those guys go for what forty five minutes without a break. You know, a typical game runs forty minutes. Forty minutes, yeah. And and uh, um, now let's ask Jeff. I don't know. I can't imagine <laughs> Jeff doing any kind of sports. That's thank you. <laughs> Actually, I played baseball. Did you play baseball? You, yeah, and I enjoyed that, and that was fun. And the other thing was before even playing in a a regular game. Okay. Mm -hmm. We used to play right on the street. Yeah. Oh yeah. Kind of baseball right on the street, with and with a, a long stick. Instead of whatever else you could find. Oh, right? oh yeah, that, well, that was stickball, wasn't it? 
stickball. Yeah, it was kids. A combo kids in New York stick. played stickball and like a fire hydrant was right. first base and whatever. And it was yeah. yeah the, the green that, car was a second base. Yeah. Or the sewer. Yeah. The sewer manhole. Uh, yeah. yeah. The green car was third. That was the way to play. Yeah. It was great. Yeah, and you you could bunch up a, a aluminum can and use that for a ball. So. Yeah. Do you know where baseball actually started? I didn't. I didn't know this till I saw that whole thing on baseball that Ken Burns did, and the whole mm. beginning of it I find fascinating. Was in the Elysian Fields in New Jersey. Was where baseball started, mm. and they started to have these these clubs. I think they called them. I think that's the way they they describe mm. them, and. Um, uh, they would play each other. There was a competition that a bunch of people would get together and play each other every every week out there in a league. I always wanted teams. to watch that Ken Burns thing. I never saw it. Yeah, I I, oh, I enjoyed the first couple of episodes because that that beginning of it and how it started to form because there was a sport that never existed. I mean, it may have existed in some other smaller forms. Yeah, well, cricket was kind of yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but have you ever watched cricket? Yeah. God. <laughs> if I want to get like a if curling. I if I want to get a good nap. Hurling is also interesting. Well, curling I like. No, not curling, hurling. Oh, hurling. Ireland. Oh, well, I know that because I would eat too much. It's like a combination. And then it's I a, would hurl. It's a combination of baseball and football and hockey and all kind of things, man. Really? Oh, it's crazy. And, and where was that played? Ireland. Ireland. Okay. They play it today. Yeah. Well, cricket is one of the god-awful, most boring games I've ever seen in my life. Curling and I, and is I'm, not boring at all. And I'm sitting there watching it on TV in England, okay? So I figure, I want to get into the English culture, and this is a very big sport in England, so I've got to watch it, and it's on TV. And so this guy, the idea is they, they pitch, and then you got to, like, hit the ball, but the... There are these sticks on the wicket or something, and they can try to knock them off, right? And if they Cricket? don't, yeah, it's really, it's really, it's really dull. And then, it, it, and then they play for like four hours. And then I said, "Well, I guess the game's over, huh?" They said, "No, we're coming back tomorrow to finish the game." <laughs> it's like Monopoly. You know, you mean you even played a game to begin with? I mean, it was just, it was god awful. You know. What about rugby? That's real popular in England. Now, what is the difference between rugby and cricket? I don't know what rugby is exactly. Rugby is like football. It's like, like football. football. Without pass. Never stops. Pass. No pass. Without pass. Never stops. Yeah. Oh, okay. okay. All right. No yeah. So, foot. Got an injury? Well, fuck you. Well, we're not stopping. Was football based on rugby? Uh, Probably, yeah. Because football bit. isn't football in England. In England, football is soccer. Yeah. So I just wondered why it isn't football here isn't re called soccer. You know, I don't because know. soccer here you can use your hands. At, uh, I mean, you can't use your hands. You can use your arms. And I know, but when I the joke I was making, in case I you were, in case you were too yeah. in, too involved with yourself, uh, Alan, yeah, there is, there was 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 that they league. in England they call soccer football f u t b o l. But there is a professional foot, uh, soccer league in in the, the country. As a matter of fact, we have a professional soccer ladies team also. Oh, I know. I know we have soccer teams. And here. it's called the Louisville City Football Club. Oh, okay. All right. Now, here's the thing, though. Why has, you know, soccer is this phenomenal game all over the world. I mean, the well, the world stops for the big games, okay? Uh, and it's probably the biggest sport, I think, in the world, if I'm not mistaken. It's the biggest single sport. How come it doesn't catch on over here? I mean, if it's that addicting, why isn't it addicting to American audiences? What is it about us? It's definitely catching on. Well, you, they, they, ever yeah. since I was a kid, they kept saying that. It's catching well, yeah, on, it's it, catching on. I think on. it is more so now. Since COVID, I think it started really picking up. Well, I think where, I'll tell you where it's picking up. Girls in high school love playing soccer. Yeah. Because it's a game that they can play. It doesn't mean you don't have to be big and burly in order to play that game and win. In fact, 
I knew a woman once who was tiny. I mean, she was five feet tall. In fact, Nicole Boxer's daughter, uh, Nicole Boxer. And, and uh, Nicole was tiny, and she was just football crazy to the point where by the time uh, she had met up with me, which was just a few years into playing soccer, she didn't have any knees left, you know. I mean, it, it's a brutal sport that way. It's actually a nice sport for men to watch as well. But women like it because they have an equal footing, you know. It's something yeah. they can play. Men like it because women like to play it. No, that's not the reason. Men don't like it. That's the problem. I played it one year in high school. Yeah. Did you like it? That was 40 years ago. No, not really. Oh, I it's thought, too you, much goddamn I thought work. you were going to say that's when you were 40. You know. It's too much work. Yeah. Well, that yeah. was a long time ago, too. Yeah. So. But um, anyway, so I, you know, I just, I've never been, I've never been a sports guy. You know, Mar Marjorie loves sports. I mean, she'll sit here. She loves uh, tennis. She goes crazy over. She's just nuts about tennis. Uh, I did, I played tennis for a short time, but I didn't like chasing the balls. So see, that's part of my laziness. Uh, but yeah. she loves tennis, and she it, she's she's up until recently. I mean, she's older now, and she has certain infirmities. But she was very athletic, very athletic. Played she didn't every mind chasing the balls. Huh? She didn't mind chasing the balls. No, she loved playing tennis and everything. She she was she was a real sports and and, and a fan. If I, I, I don't understand how I mean tennis is fun to play, it's boring to watch. She loves watching it. Okay. She loves watching it. I'll tell you, you watch people like Serena mm -hmm. and the doll and so on play and you kinda go, That's pretty good. You know, they're pretty good at what they do. You know, so, yeah. But I'll, I'll pass that along to Marjorie that you find it boring. She'll probably Thank tell you. me you're full of shit not to have you on the show anymore. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, let's see here. What uh, I'm trying to think of what's been happening. Is anything happening in the news that is bothering any of you? No, nothing. Okay, well, we'll see you next week. Yeah. Uh, yeah. i got to leave early anyhow because of my mother, but that's okay. It, it, really? What, what, what's with your mother? Oh, you're having dinner? Uh, yeah, i got to take care of her on Friday nights again. So. What do you mean you got to take care of her? What does that entail? I go over and make her dinner and sit with her and have dinner. Oh, okay. Well, that's it's nice. Not, not a big deal. That's, Just how, on a Friday night, I'd rather be doing something else. I don't know. Now, here's the question I always hate asking. How old is she? 88. Oh, okay. So she's older than me. Whew. Yeah, you're 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 safe. She's in pretty good health. She still drives only during daylight hours, not on the freeway. Um, you know, and uh, I have you ever seen those things just stick on the underneath of the side of the car, and they're like, well, they're feelers, and and when you when the curb you feelers, to the curb, yeah, curb feelers. So I haven't I haven't seen them on a car. In 40 years, I had to install them on her new Mercedes. <laughs> within a week, she destroyed the front wheel twice. <laughs> and at $500 for the rim. I used to have curb feelers on a car. Well, yeah, They were popular, but I didn't even know they made them still. But I had to put them on her, her But car you don't and, see curb feelers anymore. I found them and I put them on her well, car. Well, you would have thought... That they would have like come up with some kind of scientific answer to curb feelers, like if you're near too near a yeah. curb, it goes beep or makes a noise. There yeah, is. Ford has Ford has auto parking. You, you can auto parallel. Well, park. that's auto parking. I'm talking about something that, that's the equivalent of a for curb feeler, some kind of noise the car makes there if you're too be close to a curb. Some kind of sonic device. I don't know. These were fifteen dollars for a set. It was it took twenty minutes to install? Do you remember? And here, we talk about things that disappear from view, okay? Remember the steering wheel knob? What was yep. it called? Suicide knob. Yeah. Suicide, suicide knob. knob. Yeah. Where you could just, you put your hand around the girlfriend, right? <laughs> do this. Sort of, yeah. sort of disappeared when power steering became universal. <laughs> That's you think right. so? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, because you didn't want, you didn't want to have something like that because you'd, you'd go crashing into something. Because it would be too fast. You needed just a slight touch on the you know, right. electronic steering wheel. Boy, I, I do remember the days when I first drove a car and you didn't have power steering. 
I, I do too. I also remember yeah. the days when air conditioning was an option. I remember when air conditioning didn't exist in a car, but you had side vents. Remember the window vents? Yeah. You know, that did that? Yeah. yeah. So. Well, you know what we got coming on here? See, every every Saturday night, Kevin and I hey, and Patrick. Josh and Patrick get together, and here we are. But, Patrick's. You know. Uh, so, and it's not a Saturday. Huh? And it's not a Saturday. Gee, what if we don't talk too much, guys, because, you know, I'm nothing to talk about tomorrow night. Uh, hello, Patrick. Yeah. Haven't seen you in a while on this program, and it's always wonderful to see you. I had a little time that I could get away from a project, so you been, I got out of the You been working hard? Yeah, it, more research right now. But oh, okay, all right, cool, cool. Uh, well, you know, uh, uh, what the I guess the biggest story that went on this week was is this week that the Supreme Court. The thing got released, or was it last week? It was this week? This week, yeah. so, like it was on Monday, Monday, I think. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but everybody's going bananas at this point. But they don't know, you know. They they they've seen they've leaked the draft, but a draft is a draft, right? It's not the. Why fact. are they going so crazy over what's not been decided yet? Yeah. Well, I well, I, I think, think it's I because of the way it, yeah. I think it's because of the way the process works. Typically, after oral arguments, the Supreme Court will, the justices will get together and they'll have like a preliminary vote to decide uh, who's in favor, who's not in favor, and the majority will then decide how they will be assigned. A majority, of, I, I can't talk tonight. Whoever has the most seniority of the majority will assign an opinion writer one of the justices to write the opinion for the majority. In this case, Clarence Thomas had the most seniority, so he assigned it to Alito to write the initial draft. Yeah. That's what leaked. Hmm, okay. Right. And they say that they... But, the, but essentially, those, but it's an essentially those five people decided that they were going to, they were going to shoot it down. Well, rumor has it that Alito leaked it, that he was the one that leaked it. Yeah, that I've heard that. Sense. I've heard that, that that well, in a way it does, Kevin, because if, if these guys are, are political, as people are saying, they want to get this furor out of the way before the November election. You know, they're they're counting on this furor dying down so that it does not have an influence on the election in November. But why why would a judge leak that when that's goes against exactly what the judges are supposed to not do. But these guys are not really judges. They are partisan hacks just like Trump. <laughs> yes. Well, would you, uh, Josh, you're a follower of the Supreme Court. Would you agree with that assessment that they're hacks? No, I wouldn't. Why? Because I don't think they are. You know yeah, I mean, I can't agree with that either. I mean, as much as as much as you as much as you want to think that that goes on, I just don't think that goes on. Mm -hmm. I just don't think it goes on. I I would hope that it doesn't. Well, explain to me why then. Uh, I can't explain anything. Kavanaugh and, and Amy Coney Barrett, all three of them in their confirmation hearing said, this is the law of the land, this is precedent, don't worry about it, they all lied. Hmm. Well, I can't I mean, explain I, any of that. Because I don't know that know. they, I don't know that they lied or that they didn't lie. I mean, you don't, we don't even yet have a we don't even yet have a vote tally. I mean, all you have, have is a draft of, of an opinion, but in order to write a draft opinion, no one has to. I mean, the draft opinion that is out doesn't even necessarily have to be an official draft opinion. There are draft opinions that are written in a lot of cases where it is not given to 
the justice to right, but he feels strongly enough about, or she feels strongly enough about the issue that they say, I'm going to write my own and I'm going to pass it around and I'm going to try to get people to join me. Mm -hmm. So there is no evidence that this is the opinion and that it was assigned to Alito to often. It is just as plausible that the decision was something else or that it was still in favor of what he wrote, but he didn't like what was out there. And he said, I'm going to write my own and I'm going to try to get them to take it. And if they don't take it, that is what ends up being called a concurrent decision or a dissent. In other words, he may be in the majority opinion, but he feels strongly about it for a different reason. So he says, well, I will join the majority opinion and vote yay in favor of upholding or denying the petitioner's question, but I think it's for a different reason. So I wrote this opinion, I passed it around, one other justice joined it, three others, no others. I want it in the record as a concurring opinion, or I'm in the minority, I want it in the record as a dissenting opinion. And oftentimes dissenting opinions are written a lot like this opinion in very, very strong tones because the justice is making clear that not only do I dissent, but I'm on an entirely different planet from these folks, and here's why. Just like you would have had dissenting opinions in some of the most major cases in history that later on the dissenting opinion became the framework or the 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 base mm -hmm. for the overturning of the opinion 40 or 50 years later when people were ready okay so you would get dissenting opinions and and you know slavery cases or things of that nature by one justice or you know maybe two whatever the case may be separate but equal etc and that one dissenting opinion 50 years later was a broad framework for the overturning. So, I mean, you don't have any evidence one way or the other about what it is or about what it isn't. You just have a draft. You have a date yeah. and you have who it was shared but with. Let me, let me ask you. All eight, I mean, let, that's it. Let me ask you this, Josh. How many, I mean, is this that common to take something which has been a decision by a former Supreme Court and then to turn around and overturn it? Not particularly, no. It's not common. It's yeah. been done, but it's not common. Can you, know? you name so, a, Can you name a time when it was done? I don't know. I'm not. I don't want to put you on. Well, the it's spot. been done several oh, Dred times. Scott. I mean, Dred Scott you know? is the most most uh, glaring one. Yeah. The Supreme Court said separate but equal was was constitutional, and then they turned around decades later and said no, it's not. You know, I mean, okay. you know, Brown v. Board of Education overturned years of segregation, decades. Plessy v. Ferguson overturned decades of segregation. You know, um, Dred Scott was overturned basically by the 13th Amendment um, yeah. with framework from, you know, dissenters as, you know, in the war. I mean, but I'm just saying, yeah, there were others. I mean, uh, uh there were others with certain laws, and oftentimes those those dis, those overturning of previous cases were really looked upon as broadening the rights of individuals. Rather so than for instance, rather than taking them away, rather than taking mm -hmm. them away, right. correct? They're 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 basically have always been used for an expansion of liberty, okay? Not necessarily a curtailing of it. So all I'm saying is, you know, there are, I mean, 10 different ways that this could be cut, but it could almost be, you know, uh, I mean, I'm just saying you could have had, you know, the oral argument that the justices have, not argument, but discussion that the justices have among themselves, where perhaps seven people were not in favor of upholding this and alito was very very steadfast that he thought that it should be and 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 i'm just playing out hypothetical scenarios and maybe the chief justice said i man i, I don't know I, I i'm i'm worried if we did this you know that it would it would you know i, I don't know what an opinion well what is it what is it, like. what that's, is it? That's, 
What, what don't you show me? Right? Why don't you show me what it would look but like? But what does it do? And to, then he wrote it. What does it do to the Supreme Court? I mean, and, and, and it's standing in the eyes of the public. Well, I mean, that'll be seen. I think that. I mean, they don't seem to care, you know. Well, I think they care. I mean. I mean, do you they, think they, do you do do you think that they're swayed by public opinion ever? By public opinion, I don't necessarily think so. No. They should. I think that they, they're concerned they, yeah. that public opinion will be very negative. I mean, are, I think are, are all those people are there all those people standing outside the Supreme Court, which, by the way, they've now fenced off? Uh, yeah. Are all those people um, really wasting their time? Or, or, no, was, I don't think or would they? I don't think they're wasting their time because mm. they have the right to do that, and I think that that action helps to inform their fellow citizens, okay, mm -hmm. as to their 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 argument or their their position. But I don't I don't think that it sways the judges. I mean, I I personally do not believe that 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 protesting or whatever. Okay. Let me let me you ask know, you this. Leads though. to that. Let me ask you this. Okay, let's say they reverse Roe versus Wade. Okay, uh, so they do that. Can somebody else bring a new issue in front of that court to try and get it reinstituted? Maybe it wouldn't be Roe versus Wade, but it would be another case that would establish that you have the right to get an abortion. Uh, do, yeah, somebody, well, somebody can. I mean, it would be difficult. Why would it be difficult? Um, what's that? Why would it be difficult? Well, because it would, two things. One, it would have to make its way through the lower courts, and then they would have to agree to take it. And the same group of people isn't going to agree to take it and then undo what they just did, you know, a year from now or two mm -hmm. years from now, for example. I mean, it, it would have to be a considerable period of time that would pass, you know, before... So all uh, things considered, are the women of America fucked? I have no idea. And and even if, even if this was 100% authentic and turns out to be what is released, it, you know, it still doesn't make abortion illegal in all 50 states. So... You know yeah. the question of are women fucked? I mean, the answer but, is no. Wouldn't this? I mean, it would make okay. things more difficult for okay. many women. But let's say, but it, it, let's no. say in the fall we get a Senate that's Republican and a Congress that's Republican. Can they pass a law making abortion illegal in every state in this country? Yes, they could, but then uh, Biden would but, veto it, and they would not have enough votes to override the veto. But they could have done that. They could have done that for the last 50 years, and they haven't done it. Mm -hmm. Congress has always had the power to do that. You're telling I mean, me like they were going to do away with the ACA, and they never did. You no, know, but uh, but I'm what I'm saying is Congress has always had the power to do that. Justice Alito's opinion, okay, mm -hmm. which I did take the time to read, by the way doesn't state anywhere in there that a woman does not have you know the ability to not i'm sorry like the right to not get an abortion as a matter of his opinion or the law in states the 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 opinion is stated as such that constitutionally that right is not guaranteed anywhere in the in the, in the framework of the constitution that that right was created by a previous court and then expanded upon by another court and in his opinion it was wrongly done and therefore it should be returned to the people so he's not saying that once this you know like if this opinion holds up he's not saying and the court would not be saying from this point forward, abortion can never be an activity performed in the United States. What they are saying is, we do not view it as a guaranteed constitutional right that the federal government or a state government can ever curtail. It's not protected. It's not a protected right. You don't have a protection from a 
Congress shall make no law type of language, the way you do okay, speech. Okay, but, but like in a, lot of, in a lot of these states, they're not passing what many consider draconian laws against abortion. Could one of those states, people in the, one of those states, come before the Supreme Court and say, okay, well now judge on this and on what they're doing in, say, Texas? Yeah, that's possible. Yeah. But if if the language is not dramatically different from what you're getting now, it's not going to change the result. By the I mean, way, I, may, I mentioned I, get, yeah, I well, mentioned this last night, I, and and uh, here it's an interesting trivia question because everybody talks about Roe versus Wade. Who was Wade? Well, he would have been the appellate. You know the no the. Uh, like the, uh, the not the petitioner, but the appellant. I mean, it was no, a no, no. But, but who was he? Who was he? Well, he was a prosecutor who was prosecuting a where an individual for violation of you know of well, what then yeah. was Texas's law. See, it was Texas. You're absolutely right. He was in Dallas, Texas, right? And he is the district attorney who had um, uh, Lee Harvey Oswald lived would have prosecuted him. So that's who Wade was, and that's where yeah. we get Roe I mean, the, Wade. the issue of, you know, the opinion is mm -hmm. a lot of aspects, but, you know, there are, look, there are some key phrases in there and a lot of things that I, I can find, you know, a, a good amount of agreement with as far as framework goes, mm -hmm. because I'm not speaking about the act of, abortion specifically but rather you know legal framework i mean i would agree with his assessment that the issue should have been settled by the people via their mm -hmm. legislatures a long time ago now his opinion to basically undo many things because in some ways, we chose to deal with it through the courts. Mm -hmm. We shouldn't have done that. Mm -hmm. I would agree with him on that. But we still reserve the right to do so. We just haven't done it. I mean, uh, that's been my argument for a long time, and I think that would be the argument of mm -hmm. all nine justices, including the if, if this is a, the opinion that comes out, I can guarantee you that the four or five, you know, the four justices in the minority or whatever it turns out to be will say, we would much have preferred to have worked on something else. We would much have preferred that this issue was settled by the people before it ever made its way to us. So, you know, what they're worried about is it was never settled by the people before, okay, in the late 60s or the early 70s, and the case made its way to the Supreme Court. And what, what he is arguing and a few mm -hmm. others are saying is it never should have been decided the way that it was at the time. Vernon? And then when it was revisited under the Casey court in the early 90s, they should have overturned it then, and they didn't. They went, in their opinion, they went the wrong way. And the people have accepted that, and have, they have never chosen to do anything about it except argue amongst themselves. They haven't been able to reach any kind of consensus and what we are saying is we believe that those two courts erred in their judgment and it is time to return this issue to the people. Vernon, you have your hand up. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm puzzled. I, I, I understand exactly what you're saying, Josh, and I don't disagree with your analysis. However, the bottom line is that if this opinion comes down like we think it might and Roe versus Wade goes bye-bye then one of the main premises of Roe versus Wade is a right to privacy of a woman to decide whether or not to terminate a pregnancy as a decision between her and her doctor and if this is thrown out now you're going to have 50 different opinions in 50 different states <laughs> saying yes you can do this or no you can't and you can't have 50 different opinions about privacy. Hmm. Well, I don't know, you know, why? Because what they're saying is they're saying that the right to privacy in this particular 
act was never was val was invalid from the beginning that it never should have been granted that you can have 50 different opinions upon privacy because mm -hmm. there is no right to privacy for this particular act right. i mean that's what they're saying that this right to okay. privacy that was you know basically invented in the roe case was incorrect okay. to, to, to anybody begin anybody else here have another opinion besides what josh is saying well, Charlie brought up something the other night on one of your shows that I listened to, Alex, and that is yeah. that, you know, the 13th Amendment, which is part of the Constitution, says that you shall not have involuntary servitude anywhere in the United States. And that's exactly what's going to happen. I don't, but I see, I don't get States. exactly how you interpret this as, as involuntary servitude. If a woman gets pregnant and the state says, she has to carry that baby. That's involuntary servitude. Oh boy, I don't know if I. Can... I, I mean, I I don't see it that way. I, I wouldn't see. interpret it that way, and I don't think there's any court that's. And that's a, but he's going to be one of our Supreme Court justices someday. You know that, don't you? Yeah. Uh, let's go but, on. Let's go on to something else. I want to get other people to get involved here now. Uh, uh, this week we also have one other situation, which is a, a, a piffle by comparison to what we're talking about now. And that was what happened to uh, Dave Chappelle uh, in, at the Hollywood Bowl in uh, Los Angeles, in Hollywood, where he was attacked on stage by somebody. Uh, we're, you know, we're, we're starting to see this happen a lot where people are simply exercising their craft uh, as comics are being attacked. And I think a lot I mean, of comics feel, you know, you want to talk about your freedom of speech. Yeah. It's very unfortunate. Yeah. Very unfortunate. Yeah, that's wrong. Yeah. Yep. That's I mean, wrong. I mean, um, but what do we do about it? You know, I mean, what we've done is we've created such a hostile environment today that this is the kind of thing that goes on. So far, it's only been males that have been attacked, but let's, you know, hmm. what happens if a female's attacked? Well, I mean, I just think that, that uh, you know, that to begin with, these clubs probably should do more, or these venues security. should do more, in so far as security is concerned. Yeah. But I mean, I when you know when I was doing stuff with comedians, we never thought about security like right. that because it just wasn't needed. Nobody ever got attacked for doing their act. And God, I know that I hired a lot of the most edgy comics around, guys like David Tell and Bobby Slayton, and, and so on, who all had very edgy act, and and never ever were they threatened on stage while they were doing their show. You know. I, I just find it appalling that this thing happened. My Turns opinion. out now that they charged the guy with a misdemeanor. Well, so, if that's all he did, that's all he gets charged for. I guess. You know, I consider that physical assault. He had a knife. Did he actually stab her? No. Stab him? No, no. Okay. But he so, could have. He lunged so then, at him. Then, then, then there would have been a felony. He lunged at him. Well, I mean, no, but if you attack with a... With if, he a lunged at him that, if he lunged at him, that was assault. If he didn't actually make contact, then there was no battery. Yeah, yeah. Exactly right. Thank you, Vernon. Yep. Okay. And he did it in California, and California lets people run. Yep. <laughs> I'm serious. You could, yeah. you, could, you could swing at somebody and miss their head with the intention of punching them in the head. They twist a nerve, pinch a nerve in their head, hit their head on the wall or something. And the most you're going to be charged with is is assault, which everybody thinks of as, as actual fighting, actual contact, but that's actually battery, the actual contact. And, yeah, it's a misdemeanor here. He'll probably now, sue Chappelle. <laughs> a tall, assault and battery can be a felony, if it's like assault with a deadly weapon, like somebody gets hit with a metal pipe in the head well, or a, a, a lot of different ways. Yeah, well, I see him, uh, um, uh, you know, I mean, I, I just think that he should have been charged with a little more than that. You know, it was a little more serious than that, I think. 
I mean, there was a very good possibility there could have been some injury there. He came at him with a fake gun that had a knife in the tip of it. Was the knife a real knife? Yes. Yeah. 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 So, (laughs) you know. But they took him backstage and beat the crap out of him. Well, there you go. There's all kinds of justice. Yeah, but you know what he's going to do? He'll turn around and sue them. You know. Probably. Yeah. I mean, what do you, what, but as long as Dave Chappelle's okay, that's all that really matters, right? Yeah, well, you know, I mean, I just think we're living in a, in a very hostile time. I, I'm very... Well, no, I think, I think it's fortunate that, he, that Dave Chappelle was not injured, but is that okay? No, it's no. not okay. No. I, I think the times we live in started when Trump took power. Uh, no, I, I, think, I think it, I think it goes Reagan. back... I, yeah, I, I agree with you. It goes back to Reagan. The, it? The, the, yeah, it goes back to Reagan. Because Reagan started this bullshit about, you know, the, the, the eight deadliest words in the English language is I'm from the government and I'm here to help. Yeah. That's, That's what started all this bullshit line. with Republicans yeah. thinking that, that the government is bad. Well, you know, I just, I, I've just gotten to we the point. We are the government. Yeah. We are the government. Absolutely. I've gotten to the point where I'm so disappointed in this country right now. I really think it's on a bad it's on a downward spiral. Absolutely. Okay, there, there's no part of the society that seems to be um, uh, seems to be improving. Okay, uh, you know you would you would think that if you believe in Darwin, you know there's a thing called evolution and we evolve. And you would have thought by now we'd be we would have evolved past all this stuff. You know that we I believe in America and what I was taught was America. And what I'm really getting is the opposite of that. It's all the things that I wasn't, I, I never signed up for, you know? And, and it's, 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 it, it really depresses me. It really has gotten terrible. And it's not, it's not going to improve until we get dark money out of politics. Well, but you're talking about dark money. You no, know, what we've got to do is somehow, I don't know, we, gotta, we somehow have to change the American mindset. We have to care about being better with each other and caring about each other and, and, and pulling together to create a great democracy and a great country and a great society. And we don't do any of that. We do everything we can to tear it apart. And I'm not going to blame the Republicans because I think true Republicans are not the people who are really fucking everything up right now. Uh, what's people who are screwing everything up right now are not Repu- Would you agree with that, Patrick? You're a Republican, right? You're a conservative, right? Would you agree that the, these people are not what you consider to be um, uh, people who care about conservatism? You know, care about being uh, t- uh, uh, conservative. Tell me what you're thinking. Uh, I, I think it. Uh, comes from both sides. I mean, the, the animosity. I, I, I mean, just with the Roe v. Wade thing, right away you've got people on the left just going absolutely ape shit on something that mm-hmm. doesn't exist. It 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 was a draft, and you know. We're going to burn the country down. I'll tell you who I blame, okay? I blame somebody like MSNBC because what they do is they see a story like this and then they gin it up. You know, you're right. I mean, it's only a draft. It hasn't come out yet. It happens on both sides. It happens on both sides. Oh, no, I mean, it happens on both sides. But but anybody here who wants to put down Fox for speaking to this crowd out there and misinforming them, I don't think MSNBC is any less misinforming people on the other side. You know, and I think that what we created is a media that has become so polarized and then is trying to find their audience. You got to realize, why is MSNBC to the left? Because they see that they can sell commercial time. All right, that's it. Uh, You know, and why is Fox that way? Because they see that they can sell commercial time to the right wing. Uh, and, and and that's the that's the sum total of it. We're not talking about a bunch of people doing news like in the old days when they did news like on CBS and it was a CBS Evening News. 
it was never considered a profit center for the network. It was considered something they did because they could point to it and say, look what we have. We have a wonderful news department. And that was it. But all of a sudden, one day, somebody found that you could make money off the news, and what you've got now are people, pol people polarizing everybody on both sides. There is no center, uh, you know, no, uh, can you name any kind of media that, that's in the center? I can't. You know, maybe BBC, but... I say BBC, maybe. Maybe. But there's nobody in the center. And I think that all news should be without bias. But all news today has bias, especially if you watch those 24-7, you know, news operations. They I definitely see, yeah. have tried to stake out their territory, okay? Right, and it all started so, with the... So-called so so -called news organization. Yeah, well, I, I consider MSNBC a so-called news organization, but I don't think you do. Their opinion organization. No, I, I agree. Yeah. No, I agree. Oh, I okay. agree. All right. I agree. They're a so called news organization. But the problem is, these are all opinion shows, but they're trying to come across like they are news. During the day, they try and come across as news shows. At night, they, become a, they come across, they become opinion shows. I mean, the only thing I that, 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 uh, that what's his name? Uh, who's the guy over at Fox? Not uh, not Tucker Carlson. Tucker Carlson. The other, no, the other guy. Uh, Hannity. Hannity. Hannity has said Hannity. over and over again, "Well, I'm not a news person. You know, I I'm an opinion guy. I'm a commentator. Uh, I'm entertainment." Okay. Yeah, that's what Rush Limbaugh used to say. Well, I bet Limbaugh. You see, Limbaugh. I have to agree with Limbaugh. You know, when Limbaugh started, Limbaugh was simply, he'd been a disc jockey, all right? And he understood what it took to get an audience. And he saw a little opening there by doing right-wing radio. Because all of a sudden, uh, you could have an opinion and not have to bring on the opposite opinion. We used to have a thing uh, called the equal time provision. And that was done away with. Fairness and he's, doctrine. The fairness doctrine. And he saw that as an entry point to be able to do what he was doing. And whenever I'd listen to, to uh, um, Rush, uh, I would say, this guy's very good at what he does. You know, it's one broadcaster listening to another. And I said, he really does a good job of what he's doing. He's entertaining. I don't agree with him, but that's not the point. The point is he's entertaining. And if you take him as just pure entertainment, that's one thing. But a lot of people went out and started taking him as the gospel truth, okay? And I don't know if that was Limbaugh's fault as much as it was a stupid audience that latched on to him. On the other hand, you had these other guys that came along and did the same thing, but they were the polarizing factor. Hannity was polarizing. Tucker Carlson certainly, hell, he's close to being a Nazi for crying out loud, you know? Laura Ingram. Laura Ingram. You know, these people were all Rush wannabes. But they didn't understand what Rush was doing at his very core, which was trying to be an entertainer. As time went on, I think the trouble with Rush was, as with so many people, he began to believe his act. I think in the beginning, he didn't believe in it at all, you know. Uh, you know, he says, I hold this paper in my nicotine stained fingers, you know. I mean, lines like that, which were very humorous and funny and making and self pejorative of himself, you know. Um, what do you have? The EIB, the Entertainment and Broadcasting, or e Excellent. Excellence, Excellence in broadcasting. broadcasting. That was funny. That was a joke, you know. So, I mean, uh, I, I always defended Rush as an entertainer, uh, and I thought he was very good at what he did. But it's like I used to say about Step and Fetch It, you know, here was a guy in the movies who created a character that everybody found funny and everybody loved, and he didn't create a stereotype, he simply created an entertaining character who created the stereotype where all the people that came along after him trying to capitalize on that like Willie Best and Mantan Moreland and so on. And it's the same thing is true of Rush Limbaugh. If it just was Rush Limbaugh and nobody else came after him, you would never hold anything against Rush, you know. 
But it's the people that came after him that are guilty of creating the, the, the as we call it among Jews, the surahs uh, in, 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 in society today. And it's horrible what's happening, you know? And I think uh, all these networks should be ashamed of themselves. Marjorie sits here watching MSNBC, and I'm going, are you watching that again? You know, because it, it, it just telling well, during me. during the day, like you during the day, like you say, it is more of a news uh, operation yeah. during the during the normal day before you get to prime time before four o'clock. But you. it's still slant. It's still very slanted. It is. You know, I mean, if you were going to have a good operation there, you would have mm -hmm. some people who are to the right as well on the air at the same time doing the news. You know, but they don't. And that's the problem. Problem is over at Fox, you don't see anybody to the left. Who? They have a left wing host? What are you what are you saying, Jeff? Your mic isn't on, I don't think, is it? No, it's not on. No, it's it's there, on. There you go. Okay. Yeah. Um people uh used to use a newspaper. Mm -hmm. And the newspaper was always separate from what was at, at the outside part of the of the newspaper. On the inside, then it was an opinion. Page. Well, you had you had your opinion page, you had your editorial right. page with your op eds, you know, right, and so on. But then there was also the think, reporting of just hard news. You know? uh, we don't have much hard news anymore. No, well, that's what news used to be. I mean, you, news used to be reported, and there was no comment afterwards, like oh and. Mm, uh, that's funny. Why did they say that? You know, and, and the little comments at the end of the article on the news nowadays, yeah. and it, it it that's what started all this. Yeah. And then those yeah. comments became programs, and the programs are now thirty minute comments. Well, you remember towards the back of the newspaper, you always used to have the comics. Right. The trouble but is that's, here that's in, fine. in today. That's, that's in, a place for them. In today's but, media, the comics have moved to the front page. Right, and, and that's fine if that's what you're that's what you're after, but then the, those those cable networks became comment networks, not news networks, because you notice like even if you watch Fox or you watch MSNBC, they have their news sections where they, you know, today's news, and even when they're reporting the news, at the end of every article, it's like, oh well, that's what Trump said today. We'll we'll, we'll see what happened, what he says tomorrow. That's what Biden did today. So. We'll, We'll see how he flux, fucks up today or something like that. It's always a comment afterwards. They used to never make comments after that. It was just on to the next article, and they'd say it, move on to the next article. It was just news, but, news, you know, news. The it never is, had the any The problem comments. is that MSNBC is so pro, um, uh, so pro Biden. It doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter whether yeah. it's Fox or it doesn't matter whether it's MSNBC. They both do it. Well, he's so they're so pro Biden. On MSNBC, if you watch the local news, they don't necessarily. I don't see that on local news. You know, I mean, I'm I'm very much to the left, but I find Biden's doing a terrible job. He's really doing a terrible. Beside the point. Yeah, you know, but I'm the, just the point is, you never hear that on MSNBC. You never hear any somebody say, "Oh boy!" You know, every time, every time Biden's going to give another speech, most of no, which because are they're on that more. side. But if you go over to Fox, you'll hear it all the time. Well, over at Fox, they talk about how horrible Biden is. Right. They'll but talk about but Biden isn't horrible else. either. Biden but that's is... because it's on that side. But if you go to MSNBC, they'll talk about how Trump screwed up all the time. And they're constantly talking about Trump. Yeah. But yeah. it's just the comments, the comments, the comments after the articles is what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There used to not be that. Now it's all that. Getting, hmm? getting down to a way to change this dialogue. Uh, yeah. Alex, yeah. I'd like Josh's opinion on. I'd like Josh's opinion on this. We haven't talked about it for a long time, and that's the national popular vote interstate compact. Yeah, well, because we could get we could get into oh. the, we could get into that, but what do you hear in the background? You hear the theme playing. Uh, oh. uh, we've run out of time, yeah. but we'll ask we'll ask Josh that next time. You know, uh, only seventy five votes involved just to, to bring that into play yeah only 75 electoral votes and yeah. right now there are 93 electoral votes in play in uh different states right <laughs> anyway that's it for tonight uh, but gosh it's a good good group of people i really love having you here josh terrific having you as always 
and your professorial uh, dissertations. Uh, uh, as for uh, Kevin, always wonderful having you here, Kevin. One of my favorite people, as is Jeff, as is Vernon, as is Alan. Hey, and there's Patrick, good old Patrick, uh, with, uh, with Baby Yoda in the background. Good having you here, Patrick. Call more often. Yeah, there's Baby Yoda. Hey, listen, everybody, why don't you give a big wave goodbye, and I'll give a big wave goodbye at you, okay? There they go, folks. Okay, let me uh, let me wave goodbye. There we go. I wave goodbye, and everything's fine now. Okay. Hey, listen, I, let, me get rid of the, uh, let me get rid of the citizen panel here. Let me end it. Okay, that'll make life a lot easier for everybody. Anyway... That's it for tonight. Uh, we're off until Monday. Monday we are here on Facebook at 4 o'clock with the Alex Bennett pop-up, and then you can see it later after it's over with on YouTube as well and over on my Facebook page. Uh, also, um, uh, we'll see you again next Wednesday night. Uh, Jack Bishop is next with The Intersection. We'll see you next Wednesday night. Same time, same station in life. And in the meantime, as always, and as I always like to say, if you see her, tell her I love her. Have a nice weekend, everybody. Bye.